In 2020, the Centers for Disease Control reported that approximately 1 in 54 children in the United States is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. While symptoms generally appear within the first two years of life, autism can be diagnosed at any age. And while we are learning more about autism, there is still confusion about it. What exactly is autism spectrum disorder? Why do we no longer use the term Asperger's or high-functioning autism? Well, my guest today is going to answer all those questions and more. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Lisa Hancock, a clinical psychologist and a certified autism specialist. Millions of kids struggle with learning, processing, and social-emotional difficulties. These challenges interfere with their ability to reach their full potential. Dr. Karen Wilson is here to help. Her extensive background in pediatric neuropsychology and higher education have prepared her for this unique mission. Listen as she delivers content to inform, educate, and empower parents and educators. This will enable you to identify challenges that kids face and get them on the road to achieving their full potential. This is Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. Dr. Hancock, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited that you're here as well. You are a licensed clinical psychologist, like I said in the intro, and an autism specialist, a certified autism specialist. And we have been talking on this podcast about, you know, a lot of things that students who think differently, learn differently, experience. And we've talked about a lot of different therapeutic techniques, including speech and language therapy, occupational therapy. We've talked about language-based disorders, but we haven't specifically talked about autism spectrum disorder. and. Of course, you were the perfect person to come on the show to talk about this because, again, you are an autism specialist and you work in this field. And I'm so glad that you agreed to come on and have this conversation with me because there are lots of questions. Parents have lots of questions. There's some confusion. I think we talked about that when I initially reached out to you. And I wanted to kind of help parents navigate um, their understanding of autism spectrum disorder. So thank you so much for for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I think probably people have a hard time um, with wanting me to stop talking about autism. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you're the perfect person to be here today. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm trying to think of, and I've spoke to other colleagues about kind of the challenges that we have faced. And I think it, it kind of started in 2013 when the term autism was changed to autism spectrum disorder. It's actually where I'd like to start. Yes. And, and that's also when the American Psychological Association merged four distinct autism diagnoses into one umbrella term. And it's led to a lot of misunderstanding because I've had parents say, well, he doesn't have autism, he has Asperger's. And so can you help our listeners kind of understand from that point, like what is yes. autism spectrum disorder and, and go from there? Yeah, this is actually where I start when I give a talk on autism or even when I'm just meeting with parents. So prior to 2013, there was a distinctive difference between autism and Asperger's. And there was also the PDD NOS was thrown in there. And then I'm blanking what the other one was, attachment something. There, there were other multiple things that were sort of catch-all categories. The two main ones were autism and Asperger's. And honestly, the only difference between the two at that time meant that if you had autism, you were lower cognitive functioning. And if you had Asperger's, you were average to even higher cognitive functioning. And they almost got the reputation, a stereotype, um, you know, for that, whatever that show is with all the smart science kids that have quirky, fun things happen to them. Um, so <laughs> they almost got an, an, an almost got a reputation for anyone with Asperger's was above average intelligence. And I can explain where that comes from. But at basic, they really truly were the same thing, but that was the differentiation. You used to hear people differentiating between autism and high functioning autism. A lot of people on the spectrum find that term very insulting, high functioning autism. What does that mean? So what they decided to do in 2013 when DSM-5 came out is they took them and they smooshed them together, but they also pulled something out, which I want to bring up too. So they took autism 
and they took Asperger's together, shoved them together. They said, this is really the same thing. And then what you would do upon diagnosis is you could specify if there was concurrent language delay or concurrent cognitive delay, concurrent intellectual disability, whatnot. But they said, this is really the same thing. Uh, and then they pulled a piece out, which some people call autism light or Asperger's light, which is social pragmatic communication disorder. It, it's basically like having criteria A of autism, but not criteria B. It means you have sort of the social wonkiness, I call it, difficulty with interpersonal relations, communication, but you don't have the repetitive behaviors, the sensory sensitivities, you know, narrow fixed interest, if that makes sense. So there's that. I always like to pull out that that little part did get pulled out of it. Um, and so now we go forward and we have autism, and we have Asperger's. So, I mean, the good thing about this is I feel like people didn't necessarily recognize before how many challenges individuals with Asperger's truly have, as if they thought it was easier maybe to have Asperger's than autism. I don't know that it's easier. I don't have either one, but they're both difficult. They're both challenging, but in different ways. And so I understand, I do, I understand why they wanted to put them together. However, a lot of us, you knew there was a however, those of us who work in the field, yeah, not necessarily happy about this. And here's why. Everyone has it stuck in their head, what autism is and what Asperger's is. And so now when I'm talking to parents who often have a very high performing child, and I say autism, they're thinking that I've just, I'm bonkers. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. They're picturing, you know, a child who's nonverbal, you know, maybe doing some, you know, self-stimulating behaviors in the corner, you know, rocking or flapping. They're like, no, this isn't my child. I also have difficulty when I'm trying to talk sometimes with educators. It's like, okay, what you're thinking of as behavior or conduct issues, this is actually autism. Oh no, that's not autism. We know what that looks like. That's that's or more when I say Asperger's, they're like, no, that's not. So in their head, they also have it very well defined. This is autism. This is Asperger's, and so I have a habit of, and I tell parents this when I first meet them. I said, you're going to notice I'm going to use both terms. I'm going to say Asperger's autism. Now, if I'm working with a child who has cognitive delay, cognitive disability, obviously I'm not saying Asperger's autism, but I'm working with a child who has normal to higher, even higher average cognitive functioning. I feel like it just, it makes them feel better. It better represents to them what's going on if I use both terms. Mm -hmm. Questions on that part? No, I think that's very, very clear. And I think to parents listening who may have even had their child previously diagnosed with Asperger, and then they go in for a reevaluation years later to update testing, and now their child has been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder there can be confusion, but yes. I think you've really helped them understand how autism can look very different in different children. And I think that's really where the confusion lies. You talk about kids who are nonverbal and kids who have those stereotypical behaviors. And then you have those kids who don't have some of those same challenges and maybe not to the same degree, because then you've also have mild, moderate and severe forms as well. Yes, and so we know that autism can be diagnosed at any age, and it's said to be developmental because a developmental disorder because symptoms can typically a, appear before the first two years of, of life. But can you walk us through what an assessment to identify autism spectrum disorder looks like? So a parent who's thinking, my child, you know, is over the age of two and hasn't been previously identified. But there are behaviors that make me think that my child might be on the autism spectrum. What, are, what would an assessment look like for that child? Excellent question. And I do want to mention I am one of the few people who assesses and uh, diagnoses adults. Oh, so, good. No, because we're getting a lot of those referrals. I want to talk to you about that, too. Teens, 20s, 30s, 40s. I've not done over, I think, 44 yet. Uh, but I'm sure okay. it'll happen because people get missed. Um, I, I feel like it's really important. So since we're talking about how to assess for it, what else could it be confused for? So a lot of times, and there's going to be different challenges if you have a child that has what you think of as more classic autism, perhaps there's concurrent, you know, they're nonverbal, um, cognitive delay, intellectual disability. With that, it's pretty much what we all gold standard ADOS2, which is a, an interactive test between the examiner and the child where you're you're testing and examining them on, you know, social conversation, interaction, you're watching them interact with the parent, 
you're testing you know, sensory things, narrow interests. Uh, the tests are different as they get older. So to test a child of, say, two or three, you're interacting, you're playing with dolls, you're having a tea party and whatnot. If I'm talking with a child who's 13 or 14, obviously I'm not playing with dolls and having a tea party. It's more like, so do you have friends? Tell me what you do. What are you interested in? Um, and there's all kinds of wonderful things that have come out. I mean, it used to be just ADOS too. Now we've got, you know, MIGDIS and there's lots of different things that are evolving as we're learning more about it as a type of neurodiversity, as opposed to a very black and white rigid bing, this is what it is. So the way you test can be completely different and testing with me is completely different. I very rarely use the ADOS too. That may surprise you because I am a certified autism specialist. Um, I've been trained on it. I'm authorized to give it. I can give it. I very rarely do. And here's why. The goal is to, to pick up all the behaviors, right? So what you want to do is you're looking at the criteria and you're determining if the child meets the criteria. A lot of that, believe it or not, can just come from talking with the parents. Now, it's a lot more difficult when I do a child uh, who's been adopted um, because we don't have necessarily have biologic. Those are actually very difficult. And I could see where maybe the ADOS 2 would become in more handy. But you really need a wide range. Think about doing the ADOS. It's a snapshot right? It's what, 30, 45 minutes, maybe 60 tops of my time with that child. What if they're sick that day? What if they're having an off day? Um, we had something happen once where the child was wearing, the family was concerned about something. I think it was autoimmune. He was wearing a full face mask. How do you do an ADOS 2 on that child? So the ADOS 2 is like a snapshot in time. I think it's great as part of a comprehensive battery. But again, if you're if you're testing a child who is average to even higher average, and I work with a lot of individuals who, um, you know, we might use the term uh, cognitively advanced or gifted, not crazy about that word, but we'll use it. Those individuals can beat the ADOS 2 and have. Um, you'd be surprised. Well, you would not be surprised by the number of people who come in the door and they're like, well, there are all these behaviors that we think is Asperger's, but, you know, here are the results from the ADOS 2 done when my child was whatever, you know, four or five, and they're either on the borderline or, or, or over. They definitely have passed it. It's like, okay, so here's why, because they can compensate and they can beat it. Or sometimes with the parents, they recognize that there are some weaknesses and they're actually doing what they're doing to counteract it. So I'll talk with parents and they'll say, oh yeah, we definitely noticed social issues. And so, you know, we taught them make eye contact. When you see a friend, you say, hi, you know, when you go to a friend's house, you say, hi, how do you do? You say all those things. So there are parents that teach that. And so they're basically doing all the interventions and then, you know, maybe something doesn't come. What, what can happen is we may not notice there's a disorder until what's asked of the child exceeds their ability. And so depending on that individual person's strengths and weaknesses and personality and ability level, we may pick it up at two, we may pick it up at seven, we may pick it up at 19, 43, right? So as the demands increase. So think about as you move up through school, think about people where we don't pick up learning disabilities, right? Every year, right. curricular demands increase, working memory demands, social demands increase, right? So think about how much social demands increase. Whether we pick it up might depend on if you're in homeschool, if you're in a school. Sometimes homeschool, we don't pick it up. Um, it's, my, it's often different depending on birth order, right? So the parents had you know, one or, or maybe even two children, more neurotypical, and all of a sudden, oh, this looks different. I have a lot of families where it's the first child. How do you know if that's neurotypical. Sometimes it's not till they go to school. If your child doesn't go to preschool, it's not till kindergarten or first grade where all of a sudden I'm seeing my child against other kids. I'm like, oh, something's a little bit off, if that makes sense. So when I'm deciding what to use to test, I take all of this into account. It's also different whether I'm doing kids or whether I'm doing adults. So for the kids, what I'm using right now, um, we do have the Magnus too. We've all been trained on the Magnus, and that's all awesome in terms of sensory stuff. But the big main one I use is the ADIR. It's the Autism Diagnostic Interview Revised. It's awesome. I just gave one two hours ago. It takes quite some time. Don't be surprised if it takes your clinician. I, I'd be surprised if it's 60 minutes. I mean, if your child's three, I guess. But when I'm doing a child that's seven, eight, nine, or 10, it, it's 90 minutes. I've done ones that took three hours because there was so much oops, there's a B, so much history going on. <laughs> it basically, you go back with the parent all the way to birth. You talk about when did you first notice something atypical? You're talking about development. You're talking about, you know, motor skills, language development, self-help skills, all the way up to current. 
Um, and then when you code it, you can code it based on current behavior. But what our experts tell us is, since this is a disorder that needs to be present in early childhood, what you want to look at is the period, what they call it is the period of most unusual behavior. You would not want to use very early because Obviously, a child who's one or two has, you know, they all develop at different levels and there's a lot of skills they don't have yet, particularly social. So what they tune in on is from four to five. So at the beginning of this interview, you actually help the parents orient or anchor in four to five. And then all the questions are given twice. You answer for current and you answer for four to five. There's a giant diagnostic algorithm that helps you calculate whether they meet each of the diagnostic criteria it's set up to match the DSM-5. So you do that. However, you have to do different things if you're working with individuals who are average to even above average. Um, I weirdly have two specialties. One is Asperger's autism, the other is gifted people. So you can see where I'm going with this. You need to give a measure of adaptive functioning or adaptive behavior. And that's because with individuals, if they're able to compensate in, in whatever way, something has to give. There's no way we're, we're compensating perfectly. If we were, we would not be in the office having the conversation. And so you give a, vi like I use the violin three, any measure of adaptive behavior. What you're looking for is things that they could do, but aren't doing. So for example, it's, it's self-help skills, it's self-care, it's things at home, taking care of yourself. You know, what happens if you open the door and it's grandma and grandpa, you know, do I say hi or do I run and hide behind the potted plant? right? It's all these types of things like life skills. So you want to give that. There's a lot of screeners that I use. I think it's important to find out from multiple people what's going on. Just like with ADHD, when I'm assessing for ADHD, I want to look at school and at home. I'm looking at more than one situation, more than one environment. Similarly with Asperger's autism, I want to see what's going on in more than one environment. So there's teacher measures. I really like the ASRS, autism spectrum rating scales. There's a preschool version. There's a version for kids. There's a, the parents can complete it, the school can complete it. I like to compare the two. Giving the BASC-3, which is an overall general measure of all types of behaviors, there are lots of scores on there that can be super helpful in terms of socialization, social withdrawal. So I also give general measures because sometimes I feel like someone might have a, a bias toward representing in a certain way. And so I also like to give general ones because they don't know which questions go to which particular disorder. And so that, again, that helps me match it up. Even the child behavior checklist and the teacher report form, the, the Aachen box, they also have parts of those general measures, um, social problems and thought problems that will help line up to help you direct you in a way looking for social processing disorder like Asperger's autism. So we want to do all those things. Obviously, you need to observe the child. Generally, when I'm testing someone for Asperger's autism, we're usually testing for something else. And I'll jump into that in a second. And so as we're doing an IQ test and as we're doing an achievement test, we're testing auditory processing. I'm observing how they're talking to me, the things that they're saying. Are they correcting me? Where are they looking? You know, are they picking things up? Are they, you know, chewing on pencils? And um, the things that they talk about, do they start conversations with me? What happens if I try to start one with them? I observe how they interact with the parents. When actually my observation starts when you come in the waiting room, even though my door is not open. So I've told you all my secret. I'm listening. Like <laughs> I want to see what they're saying, what they're looking at, what they're doing before I've come into the room as Dr. Lisa. So there's all of that. And um, so I, I think that's sort of the, the crux of the evaluation for kids and adolescents as we jump over into older teens and adults. There's no standard battery in the U.S. There is for what people consider a traditional autism people with cognitive delays or, you know, they're nonverbal. Obviously, it's the ADOS too. But again, most of the folks I work with are average to higher average performing. They've gotten to be 20, 30, sometimes 40 without any diagnosis. And all of a sudden, they're like, hey, there's always been something kind of off. Usually, they read a book, they see an article, they hear a TED Talk, and all of a sudden, something lights up and they go, ooh, maybe this explains me. These are the folks that usually have a prior diagnosis they don't agree with. Um, it might be something like ADHD, schizophrenia, bipolar. These are common things that get misdiagnosed, especially in girls and women. So we have to remember back in the dawn of time, Asperger's was a diagnosis created by men for men and boys. So girls and women do not always fit. And so we have to look at things differently. A lot of it is in the way uh, socialization happens in terms of are you willing to stand out on your own, how to have weird, narrow interests, or are you going to look and you're, you're trained to look and see what other people do? Also, what you're interested in, 
for a boy at three, being obsessed with a combustion engine is considered unusual. For a girl, you know, at seven, who's obsessed with whatever the new thing is, ponies, my little ponies or troll dolls, they're usually obsessed in this with the same thing neurotypical girls are. So again, they don't stand out. So again, it's I have not yet done an adult male who's who has realized this, but I've done a whole bunch of females because they've gotten missed. So there was no battery. So I had to create one. So what I did was I turned to the literature. Uh, I think I spent something at 12 straight days of a vacation. This is what I did. Yes, I'm that person. (laughs) This is how you spent your vacation. (laughs) It was 12 straight days. And my goal was to create a battery for testing Asperger's autism in adults. So there's all kinds of great stuff out of the UK. Uh, The Autism Research Center, Dr. Baron Cohen, Um, there's stuff in Scotland, there's stuff in the Netherlands, you can find so much online. So what I did was I went through and I pulled all the research articles that went with the measures to show that they were valid. I created a battery. And so when I give the battery after each measure, when I report on the measure, I actually cite where I got it and I, and the research article to back it up. Obviously with regular testing, we're not doing that. I don't have to tell you, well, here's why I'm using the whisk. With all of these, I'm very careful to show that. Something else I want to mention, um, the reason that you might, people might wonder why why does the doctor want to do an IQ test testing my child for Asperger's autism? Part of it is because of you want to rule out intellectual disability because sometimes they can look similar. But yes, you can diagnose both with that specifier. People ask me that. They're like, why do you want to test IQ? Yeah, and and a lot of parents do have some confusion about the measures. But I think you've just done a really good job of really explaining how comprehensive the evaluation is. It's not just coming in and taking a test. It's getting input from teachers and parents and your own observations during testing, before testing, um, and all taking all of this information into consideration when formulating your impre- impressions. And then when you see the symptoms that are consistent with an autism spectrum disorder, and that's when you make the diagnosis and talk about whether this is with or without a language impairment, with or without some of the other criteria for autism spectrum disorder. So when parents are thinking about autism spectrum disorder, what are some of the key characteristics for someone who may who might have heard the term but may not know kind of what are the the symptoms and what do they look like? And knowing, obviously, this is a spectrum disorder, so it can, again, look different in different children. But what are you looking for when you're doing the assessment that lets you know that this is autism spectrum disorder? Oh my gosh, it's so second nature. It's almost hard for me to answer. <laughs> I'm I go to the grocery store and I, I can pick them out. It's kind of weird. There's actually a certain, believe it or not, body type that I found really common in it. So I just my head is always working. I'm sitting in restaurants and the conversation of the people next to me. I'm like Asperger's, so I can't help it. So it's obviously it's different depending on cognitive cognitive ability. I work with very few people who have intellectual delay or or developmental disability. It's just who I get. Um, those are generally a lot easier to diagnose. Pediatricians usually pick it up. Pediatricians or it, someone else that they've seen. That there's usually other issues that go with it. There might be an auditory thing or a visual thing. They end up in OT. Someone usually picks it up. So it's super rare for me to get those kids. The ones that I've gotten have been homeschooled and have not had a lot of exposure. Um, the one family did not believe in doctors or vaccinations, so no one had seen them. So again, that's kind of an unusual situation. Generally, what I get are the kids where someone, they've missed it, there's a misdiagnosis, and the parents are like, this doesn't fit. Something's missing, like ADHD does not describe my child, or something like, well, we've tried all the different treatments for ADHD, and we're still having these issues. The social issues, I think, are very unique. But then keep in mind, if you have ADHD, you're going to have social issues, right? right? So if I'm all jumpy and hyper and I'm all over the place and I'm impulsive, that's going to impact friendships. But again, there's a range of behaviors within ADHD. So it depends on what's going on. For me, what I'm looking for is social impairments in terms of do they look atypical for a child of that age? Now, this is where it gets sticky because I, my other specialty is in highly gifted people who also don't look like people their age. So I often find myself picking the two things apart. Is, it, is this something where when I'm listening to a child of five launch into a giant discussion about black holes, is this a highly gifted child who could also tell me an equal conversation about 18 other areas of interest? Or is this a child with Asperger's where this is the focus and they 
that it's space, space, space every day. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So it, it, you have to determine it's not, it has to be narrow and specialized, but that can be confused with a child who's just functioning above age because they look like little professors. The other thing that's really challenging is I get a lot of parents who come in um, with kids that are very high verbal and the other areas are low. So then we're trying to figure out what is going on. Okay, is this a child who's gifted verbally and low in the other areas? Uh, an asynchronous child? Is it a child who's gifted verbally and has deficits in other areas holding them back? Or is this a child with Asperger's? A lot of the kids, almost all the kids with Asperger's I test, generally the ones that I get because of who I work with, they have average to above average cognitive functioning, but it's stacked on the verbal. I mean, the verbal is way higher, the verbal comprehension, and the other areas are more average. So for me, that's an, as soon as I see that, I, I pay more attention. That's an instant flag to me. There's a pattern of things that I see that to me is Asperger's. Some of these are going to sound kind of weird to you. So complete birth history. So far, everyone that I've seen, if the child had jaundice right after birth and feeding issues, Asperger's autism. There are papers on it. Because again, I, as soon as I saw the pattern, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to look it up. And I started going through the literature. Yes, there's actually research documenting it. Uh, I don't know what it's linked to, but yeah, a higher incidence of jaundice and feeding difficulties. So as soon as I see that, a pattern of learning disabilities, ear infections, which can indicate an auditory processing disorder, visual processing issues, sensory sensitivities, Eating behaviors, very restrictive eating, sleeping issues. Um, parents are usually like, okay, well, some kind of, usually anxiety comes up. But the thing that's weird when I see the child, I don't always see it because it's just sort of part of who they are. Friend issues, I don't always see friend issues. And here's why. This is going to totally depend on the educational setting. What I find is children are much kinder when they're younger. And so if you have a child with Asperger's, right, they're, they're high compensating, it's hard to pick up. Suppose they go to preschool with the same kids for two, three years. Suppose they go to kindergarten with the same kids. Suppose they go through elementary. I've had a lot of kids who preschool through eighth grade have been with the same kids. Well, the kids have known them since they were little. And so when the child does something sort of odd or neurotypical, they're like, oh, you know, that's just Joe. You know, that's just, it, it's, it's just them. It's almost like they attribute it to personality or quirkiness. The difficulty with kids who change school, that's when I usually see the difficulty because it's harder to blend as you get older. I get a lot of kids sixth grade and high school. So they change school. Kids you don't know who didn't know you when you were a toddler are not as forgiving of social gaffes. And all of a sudden, you know, there are no invitations to things. There's difficulty making friends. Another one is they can make friends and may even make them quickly, but it's hard to keep them. That can actually be tied a little bit, believe it or not, to the black and white thinking or even to the narrow interest, right? So with black and white thinking, I might have difficulty understanding that my friend's not perfect and my friend does or says something that I don't like. And ugh, okay, they're not my friend anymore. And folks with Asperger's often can feel very criticized and they can be very sensitive to criticism. So again, understandings between friends can lead to just leaving the friend behind. A lot of the kids I work with, believe it or not, have no interest in friends. They just don't have that need. Obviously, that's a red flag that we would pick up on. So these are all different things that I would look at. I'm looking at, you know, if I have a family who comes in, often I have a child where the parents, we're not testing for that. We're testing for something totally different, usually ADHD or learning disability. And I know it's Asperger's. And they're like, well, no, it can't be Asperger's because she makes eye contact and she has all these friends. And then I do some questioning, oh, well, she's been in the same school since three years of age, and she's friends with all her parents, friends, kids, right? So it, it's a support. So that definitely works. The eye contact thing, too, I want to bring that up. We keep thinking that that's part of Asperger's. Uh, recent research is indicating it may not be. It may be part of, ooh, I can never say it, alexithymia, which is a separate disorder, but it's more common in folks with Asperger's. So I'd like to throw that out there because it's people are like, oh, no, they make eye contact. Yeah, I've, and, I've, and I've seen that, too, where people will dismiss the idea that it could be autism spectrum disorder because kids make good eye contact. Exactly. And there's also confusion about whether kids can grow out of symptoms. And I know that you've, you've probably heard this as well, where kids may have been diagnosed when they're younger. And I've seen this with ADHD and dyslexia because there might be a mild or a moderate form uh, in terms of how the disorder initially presents. And then with great intervention, adolescents no longer meet criteria for ADHD yes. because they've had treatment or dyslexia. Mm -hmm. The gap has been closed, but that still doesn't mean that they don't struggle 
because we know that these disorders are lifelong disorders. It just looks different when they're older. Is that similar for ASD? Yes, yes. High five. I love that you brought that up. Okay, they're still having the same trouble. You're not seeing it. Mm -hmm. But their doctor is because there's going to be anxiety or depression. Usually it's some kind of social anxiety. When you talk to them, it's so amazing to talk to these folks. I mean, because they, it's one of the fun things about working with adults is they can tell you one of the, for example, one of the common ones that I get, there's a question that we're talking about, um, you know, about, you know, do, do you care about people telling you like things like what they're interested, what they're doing? And they'll tell me, no, I don't care at all, but I know I should. So I force myself to listen. And so there's things they're forcing themselves to do. Well, how do you feel about, you know, group situations? Like, you know, um, everyone in your office goes out for happy hour after work. I absolutely hate it. Do you go? Of course I do. I go and I smile and I pretend and no one knows. And then when I go home, I'm exhausted and drained. They're blending, right? They're, they've learned how to do it. Often their parents were super helpful. They've been through programs like that awesome peers program at UCLA, like huge high five to those guys, all the work they're doing over there. Or even just with the parents. A lot of these parents are very savvy. They see the deficits. They want their child to succeed. And again, they're pointing it out. That's your friend. You should say hi. Oh, you were invited to a party. You don't want to go. Okay, let's make a polite excuse. They're definitely training the kids. This is a parent, even when I'm working with the younger kids. I was giving a test yesterday, someone who's seven, and he gave me an answer that really surprised me. And I said, oh, that's what you would do. And he said, yes, that's the polite thing to do. That's, that's trained, like high five, parents are doing their job. The mm-hmm. downside is you do your job so well that we can't pick it up. Does it matter? Do you need the diagnosis? For a lot of families, there are still challenges and that diagnosis can help with access to services. So that's really important. The diagnosis can also help with understanding, right? That person's understanding. I feel like they deserve to receive validation for how hard it's been because we may not be seeing it. So, you know, new estimate is something like 42 to 79% of individuals who meet criteria for Asperger's autism would also meet criteria for concurrent anxiety disorder. That's pretty darn high and you may not see it at all, right? That person who may be struggling to go around the room smiling, you know, gripping their, their drink cup. And they just go home and they're absolutely drained and just want to curl up on a ball because that has sucked everything out of them. So, yes, they still struggle with it. You have to talk to them to see. One of the young women I work with told me for her, it's the emails at work. She can't see faces or anything. And so it's the the tone in the email. She can't tell how to respond. Mm. She gives it to her roommate who's neurotypical. The roommate tells her what the tone is and then she responds. So she solved her problem. Other people have told me we have this weird idea that all people on the spectrum can't read facial expressions. Not true. Believe it or not, some of them read them very well. That's how they're compensating. I was talking to a gentleman who's older and he said, oh, he said, I'm very good at that. He said, I had to be. He said, because what comes out of their mouth, I have no idea. He said, so I look at their face and I look at how they're standing and like if they're gripping things. And he said, that's how I figure it out. So he's compensating and none of us are noticing. And I think that's how a lot of kids, a lot of adults get missed because they're able to compensate, whether that's they them figuring it out or getting some guidance and support from the adults in their lives. And, you know, many of the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder are problematic because of societal expectations. Um, and then others can put kids in danger. How do you take those two truths into consideration when making recommendations? Because some parents will say, okay, I I have the diagnosis, but I really don't need to do anything about this. I just have the information and now I can better understand. Whereas other parents might say, what can I do? Right. And I'm really glad you brought that up because I'd like to mention safety. Safety is a big concern for me. A lot of parents that I work with do not want to tell school that the child has a diagnosis of Asperger's. They're afraid it will harm them in some way. Actually, that would be discrimination. And if we proved they were doing that, that would not go well for them. So I don't encourage it, but I completely understand it. People may have a bias. They may be afraid that you know an educator or another professional working with their child will develop a bias and somehow think their child is less, or maybe not recommend their child for a program thinking they couldn't handle it, which is ridiculous because everybody is uniquely different. You, If you met one person that has Asperger's, you don't know anyone else who's exactly like them, even twins with twins with Asperger's are going to be completely different. So, but there is a safety issue for me. Often I hate to, I, I'm never one to play gender card, but this case I'm going to because of size. So a lot of times when I'm working with boys that have Asperger's, 
Um, the ones that have more irritability and aggression, physical aggression, they're getting into trouble at school. It becomes a conduct issue. And as they get bigger, and this is the only reason I'm bringing up gender, actually technically sex, not gender, um, is they get physically bigger, right? So when I have a little boy who's aggressive and he's five years old, that's one issue. All of a sudden, if he's 16 years old and he's 6'2 and he's 200 pounds, we're talking about something different. And we're concerned for his safety and the safety of people around him, right? Because if there's irritability, can turn to physical aggression. We know this happens sometimes with folks. It does not happen with everyone with Asperger's. Some folks, it will. So my concern is what's happening. I had this happen with someone. Um, there's an expulsion because it's assumed it's it's behavior, it's poor behavior, it's conduct, it's defiance. It's not. It's a complete sensory meltdown. And we have to understand where it's coming from. So letting the school know and the people that work with that that young man no this is what it is this is where it's coming from these are the triggers this is what you do when he reacts this way is protective of him but also of those around him right we don't want to engage with him in an unsafe way for the people that are engaging with him and that also speaks to the idea that finding the right learning environment is so important because yes. you want educators and other administrators at that school to understand the behavior so that they can respond appropriately, who can recognize this isn't willful bad behavior, that this is a sensory issue and respond accordingly. And then also when you're talking about about students who have gifts and talents, that they have the opportunity to demonstrate those gifts and talents in their academic environment. And that can play a role in their in their emotional well-being. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration and addressed in a plan moving forward. Yes, and it, it actually can impact things that you might not think it would impact. For example, having Asperger's and having challenges with emotion recognition or the ability to recognize another person's point of view, think how that impacts writing. It can make writing very difficult. So a lot of the kids I work with are good at one type of writing, but not another. I've got quite a few who can do scientific writing. They do great in science, but to try to write some sort of paper where they're talking about, well, here's this book and here's a character and what, they hate the what, the might, the what if questions. Um, the, the one young man I'm forever grateful to, he taught me something. I was giving him a test, the Tau 4, if you're familiar with it, where you show a picture prompt and they, they're supposed to write and you get points for things like, do the characters show emotions and feelings? Do they do exciting things? And he was devastated and he just shook. Obviously, we just continued. And I'm grateful to him because he was 12 and he was able to tell me what was going on. And he said, you were asking me to do things I can't know. He said, I can't know what that person's thinking. I'm not them. And a light went off in my head. I am forever for just, he's frozen in my head and I am forever grateful to him for that. So think about, you know, these folks moving again, keeping in mind people that are average to above average it's almost more difficult for them because they're expected to do all the average things. You're supposed to go and do well in high school and then you either have a career, you have a job or you do both and writing can be a challenge. And then people are confused and they test them. Well, they're not dyslexic. There's no dysgraphia. What's going on? And they don't understand when the person says to them, well, I can't know what that character's thinking. So sometimes the younger kids get in trouble. Oh, you don't want to do it. You're being lazy. That's not it. We have to listen. When they're telling us, I can't know what that character's thinking, I can't know what he'll do next, they're being honest with us. Absolutely. And that really speaks to their experience. And like you said, we have to listen. We have to listen to what the children, the adolescents are telling us so that we can support them, find a way to support them. How do we get them through those kinds of assignments? And then how do we also help educators understand that this is not defiance? They don't understand what it is that you're expecting them to do. Yes. And that a throwback to testing, which I know we started with, this is why you have to go to someone who understands how to test these kids. So I was giving an affect recognition test the other day, anyone who uses the NEPC2 who uses that affect recognition. And to anyone not familiar with kids with Asperger's, this would have looked like refusal, defiance, ODD, whatever you want to call it you know, slammed it down. No, no, no. Didn't ask for a break, just got up and ran. Again, I'm grateful to people who were so self-reflective. You know, the child was later able to explain to the mother, well, that test was crazy. She was asking me to pick out emotions, but every picture looked the same. 
Mm-hmm. He just gave us the answer that we needed. So someone who's not familiar with these kind of kids is going to grade that as zero, put, you know, whatever. We write up a qualitative paragraph on it. That's golden. That's what we need. Absolutely. And it's those nuances. And again, that understanding that really helps parents and helps the child and helps kids to be seen and heard and understood in a way that we want. Yes. Dr. Hancock, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with our listeners. I think that we could probably go on and have a part two for this conversation. Yeah, and I'll probably bring you back. I think I'll bring (laughs) you back because we're. I think we need to also talk about two E in this population. I had a conversation with Nicole, Dr. Nicole Tatro, about two E kids and who are gifted, and I'd love to bring you back to talk about what 2E looks like in kids who also have autism spectrum disorder. So we'll plan um, a part two of this conversation, but I'm just so grateful for you for coming on the podcast and sharing your expertise and really helping us better understand kids with autism spectrum disorder. I had a great time. And again, it's really fun to have someone not be like, stop talking about that. (laughs) (laughs) No, we want you to talk more. Thank you so much. Now, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, maybe for an assessment for their child or to have a consultation with you, what is the best way for them to reach out to you? The best way, just pop online and look at Summit Center, www.summitcenter.us. It's uh, US. It's very easy. Uh, you can click on the links. It goes directly to one of our staff members who get right back to you. Also, you can see the bios of all of us who work there. Um, I'm blanking. There might be like 19 or 20 doctors, I think, total. We've got doctors. We have we have postdocs. We have interns. We have a huge assortment of people to match personality type and whatnot. Not everyone does adult assessment. I think most of us do children and kids, but everyone sort of has their area. And you can go through the profiles and read about us and see who you think you might fit. We have a full office up north. I am the only one in Southern California. Uh, a lot of assessment can be done virtually. Obviously, when we're looking at Asperger's, I'm going to kind of want to meet your kiddo in person <laughs> or you if it's you. All right. Great. And we'll put a link to all of that information in the show notes as well. Thank you so much again for being here. Thank you. Bye. There is a lot of information packed into this episode, and I hope that you found it helpful. Thanks again to Dr. Lisa Hancock for coming on the podcast. She's a licensed clinical psychologist, and she provides neuropsychological assessments, counseling, and psychotherapy to children, teens, families, couples, and adults. If you'd like to know more about her, check out the show notes, and her contact information can be found there as well. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. For more resources, visit us online at childnexus.com.